And these are strange times for the world, for the nation states and the European Union, by the way. Established values and institutions, internal and international uh, power relations are changing rapidly against the backdrop of revolutionary developments in the digital field and climate. The political democracies are looking for a new balance in societies that are on the move. Societies sometimes even steerless. The important thing is not that there are populist leaders, that's not the main problem. The problem is that they are elected in spite of rhetoric and a policy that are morally dubious. But authoritarian regimes also have to deal with dissatisfaction in civil society everywhere. Uh, and I'm referring now to Russia, uh, to Hong Kong, uh, even to Turkey. Authoritarianism is not a guarantee anymore for economic progress, sometimes on the contrary. So democracies are in trouble, but authoritarian regimes are also going through a difficult period. The political democracies of the four largest Eurozone countries, France, uh, Germany, Spain and Italy, so they are going through a difficult time, albeit for different reasons and with different intensities. It reduces the willingness to carry out internal reforms and to deepen the EU further. I'll come back on this topic later on uh, in my introduction. Just a few years, a very few words about Brexit. So I'm speaking now for five minutes and I waited five minutes until I pronounced the word Brexit. <laughs> it's too sad a story. It's an example of how, how uh, populism and nationalism turn into masochism at least in socio-economic terms. The immaterial so-called advantage takes precedence over any material or social interest of the people. Even values, even that of parliamentary democracy, of the rule of law, the separation of powers, or just the search for agreement and consensus, all this is subordinated to the so-called national sovereignty However, I'm referring to national sovereignty, however limited it may be in an interdependent world. It is not even a question of defending the value of the will of the people, who are after all deeply divided, and perhaps there is not even a majority for a hard Brexit or a Brexit at all. My second part is, many of our problems in the EU and beyond relate to the tensions between the national and international frameworks. And allow me to elaborate on this theme. A first area of tensions is at the level of the leaders. I would speak uh, later on on what's happening at the level of the citizens. So in this tension between national and international, what, uh, what do we observe at the level of leaders? They are elected nationally, but must operate in a context of international interdependence, both on economic developments and on policies. And the financial crisis demonstrated this very well. Hardly any country escaped it. It was a global crisis. The problem of a small country like Greece, 10 million inhabitants, can become a global problem the interdependence is that strong. Leaders promise everything at the national level, but they come up against the international or European framework that makes this impossible or that imposes unpleasant obligations on them. And this is most evident in the euro area with regard to fiscal rules and for the union as a whole with regard to climate objectives. So you are elected nationally but you are working, operating in an international and European framework that imposes rules on your national policies. It should be added that, some, that s the same national leaders themselves have drawn up and, and approved those international and European rules. 
So we are working, leaders are working in an international and European framework that, ha they, that they have set up themselves. They are, they are obliged to respect the rules they, they created themselves. A very strange situation. However, interdependence and international value change are already so strong that, for instance, a trade war affects the U.S. itself. U.S. exports have stagnated over the past years. Can you imagine? It all started with a trade war to make America great again. And what we see, uh, looking at the figures, is that the result of this trade war is that U.S. exports have stagnated this year. President Trump thinks he can liberate the USA from multilateralism, but it is even against American interests. It brings his own country and many others to the brink of recession. The same happened in the UK. Brexit also wants to get rid of the supranational framework, the EU, and the price, the economic price, and the price for the pound sterling uh, is high and will continue to rise. So there is very difficult to escape from the obligations of the international framework, be it a multilateral framework or a European one. National politicians create high expectations that they themselves cannot meet because their room of maneuver is limited at the international level. And this is followed by the delivery gap. You create expectations and you can't deliver. You have this delivery gap. And the disillusionment of the national voters, who then goes in search of change over and over again. And as a result, the political landscape within the countries is fragmented and the voters are highly volatile. 13 countries out of the 28, 13 in the EU have minority governments. How can Europe be strong if the member states are weak? Social media and cyber manipulation further increase the restlessness and radicalization among a too large number of voters. An unstable government, a minority government, is a risk of voider and a reform avoider. Opting for more Europe is also considered as an electoral risk. And this instability further weakens the political cloud, not only of the member states, but also of the EU as a whole. After all, the EU is the sum of the member states. In the UK, this delivery gap on Brexit they promised Brexit and they couldn't deliver until now. You, you see a couple that tried to divorce and after three years they are still together in the same house. Well, this is a problem. Uh, so this, this uh, delivery gap results in a huge fragmentation of the political landscape. Look at the recent European elections where the Conservatives were below 10%, below 10%. They had an absolute majority a few years uh, earlier. So uh, this results in a uh, fragmentation of the political landscape and a complete lack of political direction. So these tensions between national and international, I spoke about what's happening at the level of leaders, now uh, what, what's happening at the level of citizens. <coughs> citizens are aware that the national framework is too narrow to solve the major problems of our time, such as irregular migration, climate change, major international tax fraud and evasion, terrorism, and the list is long. But it is the only level that citizens, so to speak, have control over. So they know that you cannot solve the problems at the national level. But they only have a grip, they think they have a grip on national leaders because uh, we, we, the national leaders are elected, of course, nationally. People feel that they are not sufficiently protected from real or perceived threats by their leaders at every level of power, be it national or European. The reasons for the reluctance to more Europe, 
to more econ European integration and coordination are thus related to the fact that a national democratic legitimacy is stronger than a European legitimacy. That's a basic observation. This need for protection against all those threats, regular migration, terrorism, uh, inequalities, climate change and so on. So this need for protection and anxieties that go with it have become particularly great. It is therefore difficult for citizens to relinquish national sovereignty to a higher level that has escaped their control, even though citizens know that this transfer is necessary in order to tackle precisely the reasons for their fear. So this is a schizophrenic, irrational situation. People acknowledge that they need, for instance, more Europe. But for them, the national legitimacy <coughs> is stronger than the European legitimacy. <coughs> and that's why they are hesitating at uh, hesitating transferring national sovereignty to the European level. As a result of all those tensions, at the level of leaders, as well as at the level of citizens, steps towards more European integration and cooperation would only, by will only be taken in the Union when there is no alternative, the famous TINA situation. There is no alternative. But all too often in a crisis. I tend to de describe this but it's not very well received when I use those words in, the, in London. Uh, they, 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 they choose more Europe with the backs to the wall, the, if, if the abyss in front of us, and the knife to the throat. That's not an ideal situation. As a result, Europeans often act too little and do too, uh, act too late and do too little. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, these tensions are also reflected in populism. A vast majority of citizens are unhappy, but do not want to leave the Union and the Euro area. After all, citizens know full well that Europe must work together to meet the American and Chinese economic challenges, the Russian military threat in the east of Europe, and other aspects of globalization, such as migration or climate change. Again, people acknowledge that we need an international and European framework. Populism wants to remain popular. That's a basic rule, otherwise they are not populists. That does not mean that every popular, popular person is a populist. Huh? Uh, therefore, they can only claim populists to erode and destroy the EU from the inside out, not to leave. When there is a majority among of in the population for not leaving, remaining in the European Union, then for a populist it becomes very difficult to, to say that we want that they want to leave the EU and the Eurozone. It was very obvious in the French presidential elections where Madame Le Pen uh, lost the election. She, in any case, she would have lost the election, but not with that kind of margin on the European team. And after the elections, they changed course and say, oh, we, uh, we, can, uh, we can realize our program uh, whilst we are staying in the European Union, which is not uh, correct at all. The same happened in Italy. When the populists took power one year and a half ago, after one week, they said, no, 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 we stay in the euro area, we stay in, in the European Union. So this is a, is a very difficult uh, situation to handle by, by populists. So they are, of course, their sentiment is against Europe, but they cannot say or they cannot have in their program that the, the, the respective countries have to leave the European Union because the EU membership is now, the support for EU membership now is at its, its highest for 27 years. People don't want to leave the European Union for also for negative reasons when they uh, look at what's happening in Britain that is not really a publicity for leaving. So a populist, uh, of course they are anti-European, uh, but they are not uh, in favor of leaving. And yet, despite 
Despite these tensions, the EU has been able to appoint the new leadership of the EU institutions more quickly than in the past, and there is, for instance, a unanimous position towards Brexit. The, the EU is negotiating with the British government, the government of Madame May and this government, uh, now for almost two years, and in front of the UK there is a united European Union. They thought, or British friends, that they have the best diplomats in the world and they would divide and rule, as usual. Uh, um, but this is not the case at all. They are confronted with one chief negotiator and during all those years now, the EU27 have a united position. Surprisingly so, we surprised ourselves, by the way. We are surprised that we are so united. Uh, but uh, it, it's a very strange situation when President Trump, Donald Trump, met my successor, Donald Tusk. His question was, Brexit, okay, fine, he said, fine. Uh, United States, our ally for so long. Uh, who is next, he said, who is next? And I, my successor, said, there's nobody, no next, no, no next at all. Oh, there is no next, no, there's no next at all. We stay together, we stay together. On the other hand, the political and social polarization is much greater in the Anglo-Saxon countries than globally in the EU 27. So this is not a consolation, uh, that the situation is worse at uh, the other side of the North Sea of the Atlantic Ocean uh, it is not a consolation, but uh, it is useful uh, to make uh, this observation. My third part is what should the EU strategic agenda for the coming years be? First of all, the EU must remain faithful to its principles. I will speak about the principles and I will speak about the interests. About the principles. The first area where this applies is trade. The EU has remained almost the only defender of free and fair trade and rules-based trade in the world. It resolutely rejects protectionism. The EU will continue to do so after Brexit. Our British friend said, we are the champions of free trade. The EU will continue concluding free trade agreements uh, with uh, many countries in the world even after Brexit. And the recent proof of this is the free trade agreement concluded with Japan and the political agreement on a free trade with the Mercosur countries, with Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay. And I hope that member states will not destroy these agreements. I hope that, that France, for instance, will approve this Mercosur political agreement. So the European approach is a very simple one. Firmness and dialogue. Firmness on our principles, but every time always uh, open to speak, open to dialogue. The EU has applied these principles in its negotiations, as I said, with the UK. And that's why it will not devi de deviate from the principles enshrined in the withdrawal agreement concluded with Madame May. The integrity of the single market and the four freedoms, the freedom uh, of movement of people, of uh, capital, of services uh, and of goods are essential for all 27 countries. The Union does not want to sacrifice this, what we call in our language, this acquis, which is all what was realized in the European Union. The Union does not want to sacrifice this acquis to accommodate a country wishing to leave the European Union. Why should we give up our principles for helping a country that is becoming a third country? This principle is also reflected in the fact that the single market is safeguarded against unfair competition, including tax competition, and against dominant positions by some companies. The European Commission's actions, including with regards to the GAFA companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook and Apple, must be seen 
in this light. We are protecting our single market. We are protecting in whilst we are negotiating with the UK, but we are protecting in, uh, the, the single market also within the uh, EU 27. This adherence to the principles enshrined in the treaties has led the Commission and the Parliament to have possible violations of the fundamental values of the Union in some countries settled by the Council. So this is a very important and de delicate uh, issue. Uh, we want, we want to, uh, to uphold our values, also uh, not only our economic values, our trade values, but our political and public values also inside the EU 27. In that perspective, linking the granting of European funds to respect for the rule of law will be high on the agenda. I said a few words about principles, now a few words about interests. The Union and the Euro area must defend their interests in various areas in the name of what President Macron calls European sovereignty, but some are not liking that word, so I will call it in the Belgian tradition European autonomy. It means exactly the same, but if you don't like the word, then uh, uh, please use the word autonomy. The EU and its member states have fallen behind competitively in the new economy, which is permeating all sectors, such as the very important car industry. And now what I'm uh, using is a sentence from the European Commission, and that's really striking for many, many people. Among the 15 most important digital companies in the world, there is not a single European one. All are American or Chinese. In terms of sustainable batteries, for instance, we have to become too dependent on Asia. The only way to restore our autonomy or our sovereignty is cooperation between the member states. The scale has become essential in global competition. Size matters more than ever. And our British friends still haven't understood that. They think that with 70 or 80 million you can be a global actor. It's not the case at all. Size matters and the scale is essential in global competition. We Europeans are offering the largest single market in the world, but others are making increasing use of it. They are entitled to do so, but I would prefer that European companies will uh, be uh, in the leading role. I would also refer in passing to the acquisitions of own European companies by non-Europeans, including in strategically important sectors. The EU and the Member States finally have instruments to prevent this from happening too easily. It is true that the Euro area still has a significant trade and current account surplus, but we are lagging behind, I repeating it, in strategic sectors. In the military field too, we need to move towards much more sovereignty, especially at a time of growing American isolationism and greater Russian aggression. His growing American isolationism, they proved it even the day before yesterday in leaving uh, and Turkey and, and, and uh, giving space uh, to, we don't know, Turkey or even uh, terrorists. He too, things are going better in the military field, uh, going better when I look at an initiative such as the permanent structured cooperation, the PESCO as we call it in our language, and uh, when I look at the European intervention force. We made more progress in the last two years in military field than in the, uh, the, uh, the period uh, before. The ultimate goal must be a European army. Of course, dreams are never uh, forbidden, uh, but I'm, al I'm already happy with more uh, military cooperation, for instance, uh, with this new initiative of a permanent structured cooperation. So, if there is a new European army, only then will the Union be a global, a global power. Otherwise, it will be a global player, albeit in crucial areas such as trade and climate. 
in the field of energy, uh, too, we must get rid of the open dependence on oil and gas on one supplier, namely Russia. Here, too, progress has been made in recent years. Sometimes it has to be said that the interests of private European companies are going against the general European interest of greater European autonomy. Achieving the ambitious climate targets for 2030, minus 40% greenhouse gas emissions, that's the target. And for 2050, net zero emissions, climate neutral. So achieving these ambitious climate targets will contribute greatly to regaining this energy sovereignty. Madame van der Leyen, the new uh, European Commission president said, I want Europe to become the first climate neutral continent in the world. You have to be ambitious. Yeah. America's control of dollar transactions, there's another uh, part of our uh, ch of chapter in our regaining our European autonomy. America's control of dollar transactions and of U.S. subsidiaries of foreign business gives it significant power. America's use of the dollar clearing systems to enforce sanctions on Iran and other countries has encouraged some countries, also European ones, to reduce their dependence on the dollar. Supremacy of the dollar and the misuse of the dollar are an incentive for many countries to, be, to become less dependent from the US dollar. The euro makes us more autonomous. The euro is the currency of 340 million people and the second one most used in the world with a share of almost 36% of global payments. So for us, the euro is also a mean an instrument uh, of European autonomy. Protecting the Union's external borders is also a matter of sovereignty. As a Union, we must be able to decide for ourselves who enters our territory and who does not. The more secure the borders are, the less solidarity we need to call for in the distribution of asylum seekers across the Union as a whole. It's much easier to reach a consensus among the member states on the former, protecting our borders, than on the latter, solidarity, distributing uh, asylum seekers and refugees all over the territory of the European Union. I'm using this word, which I don't like, of distributing. It's about human beings. It's not about uh, objects. Solidarity in all areas, not only in this on this issue of migration becomes difficult in the EU. Solidarity on migration divides the Union deeply between the East and the West, the North and the South. But migration, by the way, is a divisive team in the United States. It's a very divisive team in the UK. So we are not the only continent for which the migration is a key political issue. Significant progress has also been made on border control since the refugee crisis, since 2016. However, we must be aware that we need the Mediterranean countries in order to achieve this goal. Without the cooperation of Turkey, of Libya, of Morocco, nothing will happen, as simple as that. We need to reach out to those riparian countries. Migration policy cannot do without humanity, as I alluded to. Our degree of civilization is measured by what we do for the most vulnerable. Some leaders need to be reminded that refugees and migrants are human beings. Many of our parents were also war refugees, at least my parents and many others in my country. They fled the country in May 1940. We shouldn't forget this. We must also be aware that legal migration is inevitable. I give you just one example, I can you give many others. Eurostat recently showed that by the end of this century, I will not see the end of this century, most of you will do, the Italian population will, be, will have halved without migration. Halved without migration. 
So legal migration is inevitable. In addition to sovereignty, cohesion is a major objective of the Union. Cohesion is not only about income distribution, but also about the relationship between cultures and ethnic groups. But there are also interfaces between the two. The cohesion of European societies will be a major concern in the coming, in the coming years. Unemployment also as a result of digitalization, as a result of the backwardness of many with a migration background, as a result of the gap between the highly skilled and those with lower qualifications. So all this can increase inequalities, which in turn are the source of populist successes. And don't forget, it's nothing to do with unemployment, the precarious jobs. You can have a job, but so temporary that you don't feel happy and you don't feel satisfied. These inequalities explain a lot about Trump and Brexit. By the way, inequalities are much higher and are widening in the Anglo-Saxon world much more than in the EU. When you look at the figures, it's very striking. But we have to confess that social inequalities are on the rise also in EU countries, but not to the extent as is happening in the Anglo-Saxon world. Moreover, I spoke about the gap between highly skilled uh, and those with lower skills. Moreover, increasing skills is a social and economic necessity, especially as has been said in the digital age. After all, the EU has also suffers from a shortage of people with sufficiently high qualifications. When I was president of the European Council, I, I put one figure in the conclusions, nothing to do with policy. We needed at that time, 2050, one million people in the ICT sector. We had a shortage of one million. The fight against populism is not only a political fight, but also a matter of policies. This fight is not hopeless, especially when you see how the populists in the UK and the US work. The biggest enemy of populists and ideologists is reality, confrontation with reality. You can vote in favor of Brexit the 22nd of June 2016 or the 23rd of June 2016, and then you have to face reality. And you see where we are three and a half years later. That's why I'm always saying that the reality is the biggest enemy of populists. My last observations, final observations. The European countries are forced to revise their models based on the social market economy. It is sometimes said that the social welfare state cannot be built on an economic cemetery. That's obvious and is correct. But economic prosperity cannot be sustainable without social and societal cohesion between population groups, also ethnic groups, and income categories. Populism that grows on this, this lack of cohesion is precisely a break on economic growth. That's for the social correction. An ecological correction of our model is also needed, but in fact it is more than just a correction. The climate problem is also man-made. The same goes for the solutions. Some are thinking that technology will bring and solve the problem. Technology alone will not solve the problem. The recent extreme weather conditions, predicted shortages of water and food, are abundantly clear. But climate objectives, as I said, require more than a correction. They need a transformation in all sectors of the economy. No one escapes it. It's a matter of survival. In a dramatic speech, I would say it's a question of life or death. Even the implementation of the Paris agreements, historic agreements, by the end of 2015 concluded in Paris, even the implementation of those agreements will be far from sufficient to achieve the objective of staying below the two degrees Celsius increase. But implementation of the current plans is now crucial. Even if it's not sufficient, we have 
first to tackle uh, of the, to, to implement uh, the, the, the pledges made in Paris. I am less interested person, personally in bidding on ever more ambitious targets. But there is this remaining question in our societies. Who pays? That will be the central political question. So a lot of people see and they look at the extreme weather conditions, they look uh, at, at all what's happening in our environment. They are very much aware <coughs> of the climate issue. But the big economic problem is who pays? And as long as we haven't found a, an adequate answer to this, then climate change uh, will remain uh, a, a, a big, big issue. And on an international level, choices have to be made. It remains strange that it is the US that is questioning the multilateral framework. Actually, they are founding father of the multilateral framework after the war. But other global actors too often pay lip service to this framework. They say, well, we are in favor. When you look at their behavior, uh, they are not uh, implementing all the commitments made in the past while, while they become member of the WTA. Saving multilateralism is one of the main priorities for the coming years. It's a choice between order or chaos. And we are on the brink of having chaos. I continue to hope that the overriding interest that will eventually coincide with self-interest will prevail. I'm not desperate, but we have uh, to uh, hope that uh, global interest and individual interest will one day coincide. My last sentence is, there are many reasons to be insecure or anxious. But pessimism is a form of intellectual laziness. And I explain myself. A pessimist is always right. Either his prophecy turns out badly and he says, happily so. Or he is right and he's right, he is a pessimist and, turned, and things are turning in the wrong direction. But then he is right and then he will say, I told you so. So he's, he's always right, a pessimist. So better to remain a man or a woman of hope. Thank you so much.